The podcast you're about to listen to discusses content of serious nature, including descriptions of racial oppression and violence, which may be upsetting to some listeners. Please proceed with care. Beginning in the middle of the 17th century, European colonists established a brutal slave society at the southwestern tip of Africa that lasted for more than 150 years. The legacy of this period has affected the development of South Africa ever since, and it can still be felt today. This is A History of Slavery at the Cape. Part 3. The Lives of Enslaved People In 1910, Katie Jacobs, who had been an enslaved person until she was 18 or 19 years old, told a reporter, I was often allowed to go to dance parties but we had to be home before 2 a.m. I had a husband, though we were not legally married. My first child died in infancy. We know very little about the personal lives of the enslaved people of the Cape. Who they really were how they had come to be in the Cape, their real feelings about their subservient positions, and what the thought of their white enslavers. Visitors to the colony who did write something about them mostly described their appearance or their work. They did not speak to the slaves or ask them about their lives. The life of an enslaved person was one of servitude and uncertainty. They could be sold many times over. An enslaved woman named China, for instance, was sold for 15 silver rupees in India in 1768 when she was only 9 or 10 years old. She was renamed Rosa and sold four times before she finally became the property of an enslaver at the Cape in 1775. Often, families were purposely split up and sold to different enslavers. Some parents never saw their children again. This was very hard for the enslaved people. In many cases, when the enslaver died, the enslaved people they owned were inherited by the enslaver's children. Enslaved people had very little free time for themselves and it was difficult for them to build private lives. They did not have the same rights and freedom of movement as other members of the society. Many of them came from foreign countries with different traditions, customs and languages from those at the Cape. Enslaved people, including young children, were taken away from their families when sold into slavery and had to face up the hardships of slavery on their own. Before 1824, enslaved couples could live together but not formally marry each other in the Christian church 
although hundreds were married according to Muslim rites. The children conceived by an enslaved woman became her enslaver's property from the moment they were born. Even if he or some other white man was their biological father. It was difficult but important for enslaved people to form families and enslaved women played a very important role in establishing these families and in keeping them together as much as possible. It was one way of reclaiming their human and self-respect. Families could also provide a support structure to help people cope with the violence and hardship they experienced as enslaved people. Enslaved people on farms led particularly hard, monotonous, circumscribed lives and suffered the worst abuse. In Cape Town, some enslaved people had more mobility or were allowed to live out and apply their trades for their own account, provided they paid their enslavers a regular monthly fee known as kulhu. From the beginning, the Cape Colony was a male-dominated patriarchal society. Systematic sexual violence was the norm under slavery. Many enslaved women, as well as female Khoisan servants and workers, were at high risk of being sexually assaulted and exploited. In Cape Town, a considerable number of enslaved women worked as or were forced to work as prostitutes with the slave lodge functioning as the main brothel, attended by the soldiers and sailors of visiting ships. There is no doubt that sexual abuse, assault and rape were widespread in the colony and a constant reality in the lives of enslaved women. Throughout the more than 175 years of slavery in the Cape, not a single man, enslaved or free, were ever convicted for raping an enslaved woman. The relationship between enslaved people and the indigenous Khoi and San communities evolved over time. While the VOC rewarded the Khoi and San for capturing and returning escaped enslaved people, in many instances, runaway enslaved people found refuge among indigenous groups who assimilated them into their communities. On the farm, enslaved people and San and Khoi laborers frequently came into conflict with each other as they struggled to improve their lot in the face of control and violence exerted by the enslavers and overseers. However, enslaved people also entered intimate relationships with indigenous people and in time the two groups increasingly acted together against the common oppressors. Part 4 Control and Resistance Katie Jacobs recounted to the journalist interviewing her. Though I did not know how long it would take to perform the journey to Frenchuk, I often desired to see my mother. The boss, however, always refused my request. I think he was afraid that I would not return. He thrashed me only once when I allowed the young horses to run away. The Cape Colony was an extremely brutal place. 
in which the lives of enslaved people were harshly controlled by the use of legal force and violence. The lives of many of the enslaved people were harsh and short. This doesn't mean that enslaved people didn't resist their enslavement. They expressed their discontent in many ways, above all by running away. The relationship between enslavers and enslaved people was always unequal. Enslavers had complete control over enslaved people. Enslaved people were regarded as material possessions that could be bought and sold. They were listed and evaluated alongside cattle and sheep in inventories and bequeathed in wills. The life of an enslaved person was marked either by the threat of violence or actual violence. Many enslavers employed white overseers to manage the day-to-day -day control of the enslaved people they owned. At the slave lodge and on some of the larger farms, senior enslaved men were appointed as mandors. These foremen or supervisors were given some privileges and were charged with controlling other enslaved people. Not all enslavers were cruel, but even the kindest enslaver demanded absolute respect and obedience from enslaved people. Many enslavers who would have considered themselves to be good masters acted as though their enslaved people were underage children. It must have been very frustrating and demeaning for an adult to be treated like a child all the time. Enslaved people were often punished. The law stipulated that enslaved people should not be punished excessively by their enslavers. The problem was that many lived far away from the nearest court and it was therefore difficult to enforce the law. Enslaved people were allowed to report abuse by their enslavers to the authorities. However, the enslaved person had to prove the abuse, which was often extremely difficult in a society where a white person's evidence counted much more than that of an enslaved person. While private enslavers were forbidden to punish the enslaved people they owned, beyond a certain degree, they were allowed to carry out so-called domestic corrections to discipline them. Enslavers could send enslaved people to the fiscal, the public prosecutor and head of the police, or to the local magistrate to be flogged or to be tortured on the treadmill. Serious offences frequently resulted in barbaric punishments. Enslaved people convicted of theft were likely to be hanged. Enslaved people who tried to escape were whipped, mutilated or branded. Murder was punished by being broken on the wheel, which, in some severe cases, was preceded by tearing eight pieces of flesh away from the condemned person's body with red hot pincers. An enslaved person who killed their own master would be impaled on a stake and left to die, which could take days. In contrast, punishments for enslavers who excessively punished their enslaved people were much more lenient. When an enslaved person died or was maimed at the hands of their enslaver, the latter were not charged with murder or manslaughter, but with excessive punishment. The fine that was inevitably imposed for this was 100 Reichstalders. The VOC imposed many rules that the enslaved people had to obey. The enslaved people on errands always had to carry a signed letter from their enslavers. 
This was to ensure that they were not runaways. The Tulbach Code of 1754 gives some indication of the rules a slave people had to abide by. It included the following. Enslaved people had to be indoors after 10 p.m. If they were out, they had to carry a lantern. Enslaved people could not ride horses or drive wagons in the streets. Enslaved people could not sing, whistle, or make any other sound at night. Enslaved people could not meet in bars, buy alcohol, or gather in groups on public holidays. Enslaved people who insulted or falsely accused free people were to be flogged and trained. Enslaved people were not permitted to own or carry guns. Enslaved people showed their resistance in many ways. They worked slowly, broke tools, killed sheep and cattle, set fire to thatch and put poison in food. Some just despaired. Between 15% and 20% of enslaved people committed suicide to escape slavery. Many enslaved people ran away. Of the first group of enslaved people who arrived at the Cape on board, the Amersfoort in 1658. Five men and two women ran away five days later. It is not known what happened to them. Most of the runaways tried to reach the Khoi or San groups in the north of the colony or Osa communities far to the east. The Osa had a long tradition of assimilating strangers and numerous enslaved people were incorporated into Osa societies in this manner. Some runaways fled the Cape by hiding on ships headed for Europe. Not every runaway tried to leave the colony though. Small groups of runaways called Maroons lived at present day Fara, Hanklip near Petis Bay and on Tabor Mountain. Hanklip is the best known destination for Maroons. Runaway enslaved people lived there for more than a hundred years, from the 1720s until the 1830s. There was an alarm system that was set off when enslaved people in Cape Town escaped. Bells were rung, blue flags were flown at the castle and on hilltops. Enslaved people who had been missing for more than three days could be shot on sight. Slavery at the Cape was created by us, a group of grades 6 and 7 students at Cedar House Prep School in Cape Town in 2020. We are Hannah, Angel, Mella, <laughs> Candy, Sam, Danica, Ayala, Jamie, Deadon, Kit, Bella, Catherine, James, Ollie and Mac.